I don't know about Christina, but I love the heat. Don't you? That's it's beautiful. I love it. I told my wife the other day, we were driving down the road. I said, we live in Greenville, South Carolina. Isn't that awesome? Sometimes I just pinch myself. I'm like in heaven out here. And I was talking with Dr. Eddie Estep, our district superintendent, about a candidate for Life Spring that uh, we're going to be talking to them about here in the weeks to come. I said, tell the person, there's no place like Greenville County, South Carolina. You, you, you can't imagine ministering in a better place than, than Greenville County, South Carolina, the upstate of the South. Man, it's beautiful. That, that just a uh, beautiful place to live. My wife and I are headed to the beach for our annual two-week vacation, and we'll be camping uh, in the sand and near the surf, and I will come back. I will not have shoes on my feet for two weeks, praise God, and uh, we'll come back probably a little tanner than we look today, uh, at least we hope so, and uh, we're looking forward to a great time away. If you need to get in touch with me, contact Nancy. I usually don't check email or my cell phone at all, but she knows how to reach me. She has a secret code to get through. And uh, so if you need me, bug her. And she knows, she knows, uh, she knows how to find me. So, uh, but uh, be praying for you as I'm gone. Great team of pastors here that uh, will be with us uh, during these days. Colossians, we continue our series in Colossians. At Colossians chapter one, we'll begin at verse 15. He is the image, that is Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister beautiful passage of scripture this morning. I'm, I'm going to jump into it. Um, if you want to know God, look to Jesus. Now, for many, some of you, you might be seated here. If you want to know God, look to Jesus. That's, that's one of the most inspirational things you're ever going to hear. You know, it's one of those, it's one of those things you hear like, how does that make a difference in my life? How, how does the, the, the comment, the statement that the pastor says, if you want to know God, look to Jesus, why does that matter? Why would the pastor take time on a Sunday morning to say that? Well, the reason is because it is easy to misunderstand God apart from Jesus. And if you want to get a good glimpse at who it is that God is, just turn your attention to Jesus. The, the life and ministry of Jesus robs us of the temptation of the enemy to distort who it is that God is, what God believes, what it is that God does, what God thinks. The life of Jesus brings into clear focus what what God is all about. So there are some in our world today that would say that God is, is cool with sin, that, that God's expectation is that, you know, we're all going to rebel. Well, you look at the life of Jesus and he said, what, go sin no more. You, you can't walk away from God saying the expectation is that we all rebel. Jesus said, go sin no more. Jesus is not... Uh, is not a, a, uh, a one to mince words at that point. He's not saying go and sin no more, but I doubt you can. Jesus can keep us from rebellion. 
So some would say, well, if Jesus expects us to be uh, free from sin, then we need to stay clear of sinners. Well, Jesus, again, brings, brings a clear picture there. What does he do? When everyone else is running away from what, what society says are the bad people, the sinners, the folks you're supposed to stay away from, what does Jesus do? He walks up to them, touches them when you're not supposed to, on the shoulder, on the arm. He, he, he will go to their house and eat dinner with them, which I always find interesting that the Pharisees, Sadducees are complaining about who it is that Jesus is in or eating dinner with, and for some reason they're always really close to know about it. Jesus connects himself with those who are outside of relationship with the spiritual world and invites them into relationship with himself, into life with himself. You can't look at Jesus and get God wrong. And so, even though this passage spends a great deal of time uh, talking about the preeminence of Jesus and the power of Jesus and and how it is that all of creation is held together by Jesus, for for this first point of this message this morning, I I just want to take just a few moments here before I move on to some other thoughts in this passage to make it very clear. We can sometimes get God wrong if we separate ourselves from the life and ministry of Jesus. And so we need, to, we need to make sure that we are falling in love with this Jesus so that we can better understand who God is. All the rest of scripture makes so much more sense when I come to terms with who Jesus is. And if something that I think about God is not in line with who it is that Jesus is, then I might need to go back and take another look at what I believe to be true about God. I'll share a little bit more about this in just a moment, but man... You, you realize how, how, what a sense of humor that Jesus has? Some of us think that God is so serious, and he is serious. But, but Jesus, Jesus loved life, and he enjoyed living in relationship with people. We get a good picture of God when we look at Jesus. And if you're struggling with who it is that God is and his character, his nature, whatever that is, we just, just take some time and dig into the Gospels and reconnect yourself with the person and the ministry of Jesus. You'll fall in love with God again when you do. Where I want to spend much more time this morning is in the idea that Jesus brings peace to the troubled mind. We see in this passage the idea that Jesus is this one who brings peace. As I was studying for this passage, I I went to Noah. Because there are a lot of things in life that can trouble our mind. Cancer, family disputes, marriage disputes, children, work situations, and as we even heard this week, death. Stuff that troubles the mind. And I look at Noah. And here's this guy who who wants to follow God. And everybody else around him is in rebellion. He has some family members that want to follow God. But by and large, Noah and his family, everybody else is trashing God. So God says, I'm going to flood the earth. Noah's like, what's that? You know, there's never been a flood. He doesn't know what that is. So I want you to build the biggest boat you could ever imagine. I'm going to tell you how to build it. I'm going to tell you the exact dimensions. And and then I'm going to fill that boat with all the animals that I want on that boat. So go to it. Biblical historians believe that it took somewhere between 55 and 75 years to build the boat. A few believe that it could have taken less time. So let's go with the few that think it could have taken less time and let's just go conservative and say Noah really went at it and he got it done in 40 years. You start building the boat when you're 20. You finish when you're 60. 14,600 days building a boat. That doesn't sound fun to me at all. 14,600 days of giving your life to building a boat. Now, he was much older than we 
are today. But can you imagine starting a boat when you're 20, ending when you're 60, getting on it with a bunch of stinky animals and God shutting the door? It's a great life. Add to it that every one of those 14,600 days is filled with ridicule. Look at Noah, the idiot. Look at Noah, the moron. When's the flood coming? When's the flood coming? When's the flood coming? 14,600 days of emotional, relational turmoil. It's painful. Can you imagine going 40 years being made fun of by all the people around you? It's difficult. Jesus brings peace to a troubled mind. Now, I I begin my messages sometimes months in advance, primarily because I want to make sure that our creative team has time to consider what it is that uh, we might do to help bring these messages to life visually. So the, 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 the idea for a sermon series on Colossians has been a part of our conversation for months. And I knew that on this day we were preaching uh, beginning at first, or excuse me, beginning at Colossians chapter one, beginning at verse 15. I've known that for months. Knowing that I was at uh, Pittsburgh District Teen Camp and knowing that District Assembly was coming, I was trying to get a head start on some of these messages, creating foundational outlines so that God could be percolating in my heart and mind. I could be looking for things that might fit uh, sociologically, uh, biblically, trying to make sure that I I, I presented a, a, a message to you that had integrity and it wasn't hastily put together due to the schedules of life and And so I'd been working on these messages and got back from district assembly and uh, and Wednesday morning gave some time to this message and uh, and then Wednesday afternoon, uh, it was like life picked me up, put me in a garbage disposal and just started shoving me in there until I was ground to bits and on my way to the water recycling plant. You ever have one of those weeks? I tend to be a life optimist, and so I don't talk about these kind of things. Nancy might hear that and be like, really? Yeah. (laughs) And so if she says really, uh, that's a good thing. I've had people say, I can't relate to the pastor because he doesn't ever hardly seem to have a bad day. Usually, I'm able to keep perspective. Everything that we encounter in life is temporary. It's temporary. There's going to come a day when I'm going to be with Christ and all this stuff is done. It's temporary. Usually I'm able to keep that temporary focus. Not this week. I was frustrated. I was annoyed. I I wrestled with anger. I was, on Thursday night, I was laying in bed and my wife was the only one that knew. I told her I was looking forward to, to, I was looking forward to washing my truck. She said, why? I said, because when it's done, I know it'll be good. (laughs) I, I, I wanted to look at something that was finished and just see that it was done. And I knew for, until I got in it again, it was going to be perfectly clean. I was frustrated. I jumped out of bed and I lay in the living room crying out to the Lord. And at certain points I said, Jesus, I I don't even know what to pray about this. Father, would would your spirit pray for me words that I can't express to you because I, I need you to pray for me? I was frustrated. Came to the office Friday morning. Time to work on the sermon again. Jesus brings peace to the troubled mind. I'd forgotten that was in there. I opened my journal. Father, are you kidding me? (laughs) Dot, dot, dot. Are you absolutely kidding me? (laughs) Oh, man. God had to be laughing. 
At least I think he was. Here I am working on this sermon and then I get smacked and I'm struggling and I'm wrestling and I'm fighting and the temptations to anger come and, and I'm cu- getting ready to come back to my office. Jesus brings peace to the troubled mind. I said, man, I got to come back to this because I found something in here at one point that I didn't quite get. And so I'm digging in the scripture, digging in the scripture, digging in the scripture. Jesus brings peace to the troubled mind. It was then as I was looking through this whole idea of knowing Jesus that all things were created through him and for him. He's before all things. And in him, everything is held together, including Terry. And he's the head of the church. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And he's reconciling everything to himself. I remembered the times in my parenting when I, when I purchased a gift for Tori or Elizabeth. And I couldn't wait for Christmas morning or their birthday so they could open that gift. I couldn't wait to see the look on their face. You, you, you know that? I remember when my parents would bought me, bought my brother or me certain gifts. There was always a gift that we were supposed to share, and it was like an Atari 64. I know that dates me, but... Uh, or an, uh, we also had a Commodore, uh, Atari and then a, a, a Commodore 64. It was, it, was, it was like, it was awesome. And my parents were sitting on the edge of their... Of their, of their seats in our living room on Christmas morning while my brother and I tore into that. And we were like, oh, this is, you know, that. And my parents, the joy that filled their heart when they saw the looks on our faces of surprise and rejoicing, and then they see us, can we play with it? Can we play with it? That, that sense of anticipation when, when I was arm in arm with Elizabeth and, and all she wanted to do was open the door and see Paul on her wedding day. It was that picture of Jesus that I found on Friday. And it was that picture of Jesus that brought peace back to a troubled mind. The image of a Jesus who was on the edge of his seat today to bring peace to his kids. Not passive, laid back, relaxed with his arms folded, saying, why don't you convince me that you're worthy of me to bring peace to you? No, this Jesus is actively pursuing his kids that he might gift us with his peace. And peace came as I saw Jesus, as I encountered Jesus, and the troubled mind went away with the image of Jesus. My friends, sometimes the answer of Jesus is just something we throw out there. But for me, the answer was Jesus. Jesus brings peace to a troubled mind. The last thing I want to share with you this morning is that uh, Jesus reconciles, restores the alienated from and those hostile to God. Jesus restores, reconciles, redeems those alienated from and the scripture says hostile to. One of my favorite conversion stories in scripture is Saul. He hated Christians. His greatest joy in life was seeing them suffer. His greatest privilege in life was hunting them down and tearing them from their family's grips, throwing them into a coliseum and watching them burn. He loved seeing Christians scatter when he came to town. And scattered they did. They went to places like Philippi, Colossae, 
Ephesus, Galatia, Corinth. Those places sound familiar to you? They happen to be a whole bunch of letters in our Bible. Christians scattered there. Now here's the the cool irony about the deal. Jesus shows up on the road to Damascus and and has an encounter with Paul. Paul, what are you doing, man? you're, You're killing me. You're killing my kids. You need to knock it off. Blinds the man. Sends a scared Christian to go pray with Paul. And that scared Christian gets to be the first person to pray with Paul and disciple him. And so then what does God do? He sends Paul to all the places where the church has been scattered to disciple the church after he's been discipled. I personally think that's cool. The man who scattered the church ends up going to every place that he scattered them to help the church to advance the mission of Jesus. Sometimes when we're, we think about folks about coming to Christ, we, we categorize the difficulty. We have a 10-year-old in the church, I'm sure. We think it's easy for them to enter into relationship with Christ. I mean, what have they done? Maybe have lied to their parent. Maybe have kicked their brother or sister or pinched them, bit them. You know, what have they done? But an ISIS soldier? That's got to be more difficult, right? I mean, look what they've done. Do you realize that to Jesus, it's just as easy to save an ISIS soldier as it is a 10-year-old child? This is, this is not like rocket science to God. This, this Paul was like an ISIS soldier and Jesus shows up and transforms this man's life. When I pray for folks that need Jesus, who are outside of relationship with him, I never pray in despair, never. I might pray with passion, I might pray with urgency, my prayers might be fervent, but I never pray in despair because I know the power of Jesus to transform even those who are hostile to himself. We're seeing this all around the world where Muslims are seeing visions of this Jesus and they're coming to Christ. We're seeing it around the world. It is not a difficult thing for Jesus to transform a person's life. It's simple for him. He he has already done almost everything there is necessary to make that happen. The hard stuff's already been done. Sinless life, died on a cross, rose from the dead. That's almost everything there is. And so when I pray for somebody, there are individuals that I'm praying for that that God would send his spirit. It's provenient grace. It's intercessory prayer. Recapturing this lost prayer form of calling out to the Lord saying, Jesus, I know you care about that person so much more than I do. I believe that you are actively and presently sending your provenient grace to that person. I believe you are active and present whenever they go to bed, that your spirit is in their brain, in their soul, convicting and convincing of sin. I believe it is what you want to do. I believe you have heard my prayer. I believe that you are actively going and speaking as only you can. I I pray with boldness when it comes to praying for folks that don't know Jesus because I believe Jesus can still redeem and save a lost person's life. I believe it. Who do you know that needs Christ? It is not difficult for Jesus to transform that soul. He has the power to transform those who are hostile. I have cousins who when a friend passes away, they always preface it by saying, I'm not too religious, but if any of of you are, will you pray for so-and-so? 
Some of them are borderline alcoholics. Jesus can transform their life. I know a man has left his wife, been praying for him. He's showing signs of the prevenient grace of God at work in his life. I believe God can transform the person that's hostile to him. If we prayed with that kind of fervency, with radical belief in the power of Christ to change people's lives, man, God's grace flying everywhere. It's exciting to consider, folks. Don't remove God from Jesus. If you're weary today, connect to Jesus. If you know somebody that needs Jesus, ask him to send his spirit. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the message about Jesus. Thank you that when we are troubled in connecting to Jesus, we find peace. Lord, the picture of the the men and women that I'm praying for, you see them in my mind. I won't embarrass them by mentioning them by name today. But in the name of Christ, send your provenient grace to them today that the power of your Holy Spirit would share with them, even if they're hostile, that you have the power to transform their life. Now, Lord, speak your peace to us today, and may we leave knowing that you will hold us fast, and we can trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you in a couple weeks.